Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Yasmarida La Flor, and I did my fellowship at the Smithsonian Marine Station Lab in Fort Pierce, Florida, looking at treatments for stony coral tissue loss disease. And so I want to give you a little background first. There's been an overall decline in coral species and coral cover um, over the, all over the world. This can be due to thermal and anthropogenic stressor, stressors that leave corals vulnerable to opportunistic pathogens. And due to that, disease outbreaks have devastated coral reefs very severely. Um, there are many coral species affected. Some of those, those include Coralpophilia natans, Pseudodiploria strigosa, and Orbicella annularis, which have reduced their, from, their initial, from their initial densities over um, 25%. Um, so why are coral reefs important? That's a very good question. Um, well, in addition to them being beautiful, of course, uh, they are very important for a lot of marine ecosystems. A lot of, um, a lot of marine organisms use coral reefs as their habitat, and they also protect our shorelines from natural disasters. In addition to that, they provide um, economic support uh, Reef-related activities contribute to $6.1 billion and support 71,000 jobs annually in Florida specifically. And the reason I bring up Florida is uh, the disease that I, look, that I look at at the Smithsonian Lab is stony coral tissue loss disease, which was first observed along the Florida Reef Tract around 2014. It was first observed in Miami-Dade County, and it just moved north and south since then, and has basically covered the whole Florida reef tract, and has affected over 24 species of corals with high mortality rates. There's no known, known primary pathogen uh, right now, but there's a lot of efforts into learning more about this, dis this disease. And my main objectives of this project were to isolate novel probiotics with different medias and different growth conditions, uh, to find alternative treatments, to test alternative treatments, um, such as essential oils, and to, to find the optimal delivery methods and optimize preparation protocols for field days, for when the field team, the scuba divers, and would go and treat the corals in the ocean. And so to isolate the probiotics, um, I wanted to look at four different medias. Currently, the library of microbes that we have at the station are strictly bacterial. So I wanted to look at other medias that would grow other microbes. Um, the only two that I got that I have uh, tested thus far due to you know, corona and everything uh, were seawater auger, which is a nutrient-rich media for marine bacteria, and potato dextrose auger, which is for marine fun fungi. Um, so when, I get, when we get back uh, soon, hopefully, <laughs> uh, I will be using minimal media and actinomyces media as well. And I wanted to look at the um, bacterial diversity across these five coral species as well. Um, the species that I chose, some of which are very low in their, from their initial, de initial densities and have been highly affected by this disease. So these are those five species. And so my isolation methods first started with cutting fragments of the coral and then putting them in conical tubes where I could agitate them by vortexing. And that was just so that the mucus could really slough off of the coral and I could get a good sample to then plate them on um, auger, auger, which is nutrient rich media, growth media. And from the media plate that I would initially plate the bacteria, the mucus on, I would then do dilutions and pick individual colonies and streak them out um, to purify them on another plate. And from that plate, I would then choose those individual col col colonies, which were pure of one specific strain and patch them onto another plate. And so from the genotypes that I looked at, which are on the left, I isolated a total of 697 bacterial isolates. And from, those, from the two that I tested, which was MCAV2 and MCAV3, I did assays on those genotypes and 
from those two genotypes, there was 14 that were inhibitory isolates. So basically I tested those, I, those isolates against bacteria that was pathogenic, known from this disease, and 14 of those isolates were, um, were inhibitory. Another thing that I looked at was alternative treatments. Um, we, we need, we, we have a, a secondary pathogen that we know of, which is Vibrio chorolyticus, and in order to, to treat that pathogen, we are looking at essential oils. Essential oils are plant extracts that have been used not only in human medicine, but they're used in aquaculture and fisheries for animal husbandries. These plant extracts are antimicrobial, antifungal, antiparasitic. Um, they have all of these properties and they have been used in fishery studies, um, which have tested different essential oils against bacteria strain, bacterial strains uh, to use as preservatives um, that prevent microbial contamination and the growth of foodborne pathogens. These essential oils are also much more cost effective compared to manufactured drugs like antibiotics. Um, and they're also environmentally friendly, which means that they, they would provide um, essentially minimal to, to no dangerous effects on surrounding um, organisms if tested in the fields on corals. And so this is my overall method. I would basically use the solid nutrient-rich agar um, to put a target bacteria, which would either be the probiotic or the pathogen. And then in the wells, I would drop in the essential oil. And after a 24-hour incubation period, I would um, measure the zone of inhibition, which is the, back, the zone where, a clear zone, where there was no bacterial growth due to the essential oil um, combating the bacteria. And these are the results from my probiotic assays against the essential oils. <clears throat> so we want a treatment that won't negatively affect the probiotics. Uh, from here, you can see that some of the oils like clove, peppermint, and cedarwood had absolutely no activity against the probiotics. But when I tested those against the pathogens, they had no activity against the pathogens either. So not useful. Um, one, one essential oil, cinnamon, had very high activity against the, um, against the probiotic, which wouldn't be good either because if we use these treatments together, if we use essential oils and probiotics together in the field, we don't want the essential oils to essentially cancel out the probiotics. And so I found that lemongrass was a pretty promising alternative treatment. It had low activity against the probiotic, but high activity against some of the Vibrio strains and other bacterial strains. And in addition to doing the essential oil assays, I also looked at a different field deployment methods. I looked at encapsulation. Um, so basically it's like a little um, essential oil caviar ball. And um, the idea is that these essential oil uh, encapsulated balls would diffuse onto the coral. So I tested it kind of preliminarily in a vial and as you can see, there's some diffusion happening, um, but I will be doing an experiment um, with diffusion rates and all of that in the future. The last thing I looked at was how to streamline the probiotic preparation process. Um, because the, uh, field trials are happening, well, not currently, but we have begun field trials within the past few months. Um, it's very weather dependent, climate dependent. So if it's a bad day to go out for the field team or the scuba divers that are gonna treat the corals, then they can't go out. So we have to be ready at a moment's notice with the probiotic treatments. So I looked into freeze drying the bacteria, which um, would potentially decrease the total prep time by 24 hours. And we used a microbial freeze drying buffer and just freeze dried it overnight. And on the right, you can see the, um, the bacterial pellet. <clears throat> These are the results from the experiment. Um, the the freeze-dried pellet was resuspended in one-to-one -one ratio of filtered seawater and then um, dilutions were conducted and a colony forming unit count was 
uh, taken after 24 hours. And from that, I found that there was only a two log reduction in bacterial cell size post freeze drying. So that means that there was about 100 times less cells, which isn't bad at all. After I inoculated a thousand, um, 100 milliliter flask of our growth media with the, pel the freeze dried pellet, there was uh, growth in the culture. And so lastly, I just wanna give you guys kind of a PSA. Um, these are some, there's, there's a lot of things that, can, that you can do as an individual to, um, to help with all of the coral reef initiatives, coral conservation initiatives. Um, there are so many organizations that you can look into and reach out to, to be a part of and collaborate with. Some of those are on the top right there. And it's really important to um, be aware and get involved. Uh, some little things that you can do are just reduce your um, plastic use, reduce your water usage, um, little things like that. The reef connects us all, so it's very important for us to do our part. And I want to say thank you to my mentors and advisors, Dr. Valerie Paul, Dr. Blake Ishijima, Dr. Jennifer Sneed, and Eileen Graham and Chris Wu for this program. Thank you.